I get into a Zoom meeting. So I just hope connection and everything stays strong for the for at least the next 35 minutes so we can get through this together. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I just, uh, okay, so I'd just like to briefly welcome Kirsty um, and then we'll get straight into your presentation. So for those of you who don't know, Kirsty is the global CEO of the Training Room Online or TTRO. Um, and she has over 25 years experience in, in teaching and learning. Um, and as, as I was preparing for this webinar, I was interested to find out that Kirsty was actually born in New Zealand and that teaching and learning is not her first passion. Her first passion was in fact music. Um, and she has a music degree and she was a concert pianist before her second passion, which is education and learning and teaching came in. Um, and so she moved into the education space um, and she's a passionate believer in using technology as an enabler um, to support um, lifelong learning. And uh, she started TTRO in 2008 um, and they work, and they're probably one of the most well-known uh, learning and development companies in South Africa, and they work across a number of industries and sectors. So Kirsty, we are very happy to have you with us today as we're talking a little bit about digital learning and what it means, um, and perhaps also looking in, in terms of what it means, not where we are just now during this crisis, but also where we are going in the future. So thank you very much for being here with you. As Kirsty presents, there's, there's certain points in which she will stop, but we will hopefully still have a bit of time at the end for questions and discussion. So you're welcome to talk um, as we're going through, to, to not talk rather, to share your, your questions or comments in the chat. And if we have time at the end, we'll certainly get to those. Over to you, Kirsty. Thank you. Thank you very, very much and a warm welcome to everybody who's joined this webinar and a big thank you to Nariosa for the opportunity to, to be here with you today. I really do appreciate it. Um, and I'm also just going to put out up front that I will be sharing the, the, the slide presentation with you all. So you, if there's anything, there's a lot of detail in some of the slides and you're absolutely welcome to be able to have these slides afterwards. So I'm going to kick straight in and I'm hoping that that you can all see the screen okay. So a little bit about us. Um, Greg's done a fantastic introduction and thank you very much. Um, yeah, founded in 2008, really, really passionate organization around helping to create transformative learning experiences where technology enables that. So it's not about the technology, it's about the enablement that it brings for us to be able to create learning experiences. And I think that's what we're really passionate about and have been doing. And obviously through this pandemic, you know, we've had a lot of people reaching out to us asking for advice as to how they can help to pivot their organizations, how they can keep continuity in the teaching and learning pro, you know, process. And, and how can they look to do that, not just for now, but how can they look to do that sustainably as part of their business model going forward? Um, so that's what we do. We sort of see ourselves being part consultancy and part digital agency. So we've got that ability and the knowledge to be able to help entities and organizations and institutions to transform, but also in a really big space of creativity and innovation in and around that. So the next slide looks at the reality of learning today. And I guess this is coming more from sort of a corporate workspace, but I guess if we take it in the context of ourselves as individuals, on a journey where we all need to keep learning. And um, part of our sort of tagline is that we must never stop learning. I think the reality of learning today is really, really true around almost the reality of life. And if anything, what we'll certainly notice within the pandemic and through lockdown, it's kind of created a little bit more calm. It's slowed us down a little bit. But by and large, you know, we see on the four key areas around the outside of the slide that you know, people are really quite overwhelmed. Um, there is so much going on. There is so much change in organizations, so much pain, change in life in general. Technology is changing the way in which we do many things in our lives. So I think the fact that it's untethered, learning is untethered. It's happening from several different locations. People are restructuring themselves to work in different ways to accommodate their lifestyles. Now, that's been, this slide was put together before COVID-19, I think it's never been more true. So those percentages and statistics probably look a little bit different today. Uh, from a learning point of view, we need learning to be more on demand. We need to know things more at that moment in time. And through the presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about learning and the flow of work um, and the way that learning is adapting and changing in order to be different and more relevant for what people need. Um, we talk often about, you know, the, the, the lifetime of skills and the, the currency of skills. So skills that we acquire and what we have today 
really have a much shorter currency in their lifetime or lifespan than what they used to. So we're having to constantly adapt for new skills that we need to acquire, relearning and unlearning and learning different things all the time is a really a big part of what our normal is and even more so I think into the future. From a collaborative Sorry, point of view. Interrupt. Yes. Sorry, um, can you put the presentation into presentation mode just to make it a bit bigger? Sorry, or I thought I'd done slide, that. Um, slideshow mode. Bigger. That's right. There we go. Apologies, I thought that it was done like that. Sorry. Um, so from a collaborative point of view, um, you know, people wanting to access and develop personal and professional networks and collaborate in a mode of social learning. And I've got a slide that talks to social learning a little bit further in the presentation. And, and this notion of being empowered by learning, you know, being able to learn things as and when people need to know it. And I think, you know, Google and the extent, you know, changed the way in which we, we do things anyway and the way we acquire knowledge. You know, we actively go and seek what we need at that moment in time. We have these micro moments of learning um, and learning that happens, um, again, in the flow of work. But typically we're seeing that 1% of a typical work week is what employees have available with everything else that's going in, on in and around their lives to focus on training and development. So it's not a lot of time. So we've got to use that time in order to create the greatest impact. And just a quick quote to you that I really like, we must change not only what we learn, but also how we learn. So the ways in which we're going to learn going forward will leverage technology a little bit more. And fortunately, these ways of learning have been there for some time. It's just how do we find a different approach in the adoption of it? How do we help to solve for any challenges that we might need to solve for? But ultimately, I think through this pandemic, it's going to accelerate what was there in the space of digital and blended learning. And it's going to give us the opportunity to really rethink the way in which we want to learn going forward. Um, and that sort of leads in a little bit to this slide. So shifting the focus for learning design. So the old way in terms of the Kirkpatrick model from a learning output is people needing a course. Whereas when we're looking at it from a flipped Kirkpatrick model, we're saying we need a business outcome. And what is that business outcome? And how does that align us into thinking about our learning design? So are we designing for courses or are we designing for outcomes and skills of today, tomorrow, and into the future. And it's a really different way of thinking about the output of what we're designing in curriculum, what we're designing in learning, um, and, and how we focus our thinking on that. So there's a little bit more that I'll discuss around that now. So what I thought might be helpful, and um, when we were preparing for this much more successfully than how today's gone earlier in the week, um, I understand in the audience, we've got a number of you in higher education um, institutions across the continent. So what I felt would be helpful perhaps is just look at some of the trends in the world of education and some insights from industry leaders. So sort of starting out with this first slide, and again, I'm not going to talk through all of the points and I'm going to share these with you for reference later, but Looking at some of the external trends, so based on a benchmark that supports the services recommendation, so this is a Gartner report, and we broke down some of the findings into five key areas. So we're looking at the future of learning in the top left. So the shift towards more practical and skills-based training, the impact of industry four, so what is the fourth industrial revolution bringing that means that we need to think a little bit differently around the way in which we're not only building curricula, but delivering curricula. How do we bring real world experiences into higher education? And it's this notion of talking about the bridge between academia and industry or academia and the world of work. How do we think about that from a future of learning point of view? Um, and how do we make it more relevant what we're doing in our academic world to what is happening in the world of work? And make sure that we're preparing young people and preparing um, our learners for real opportunities that exist. Sort of below that, it then talks into the future of work, the gig economy, new employment models. I think, again, you know, one of the outputs of this pandemic is that the gig economy will accelerate in an opportunity. More people will work on freelance and contracted basis from wherever they choose to be. You know, not necessarily needing this um, fixed place of work and fixed hours of work. You know, we can create a lot more flexibility, which the gig economy drives. Um, lifelong learning, um, spoke about it a, a little bit earlier about this never stop learning, the, the, the need to really link the value chain of learning right from early childhood development all the way through to the world of work. 
And how do we look to use technologies that exist today to really map relevant career paths? And through mapping relevant career paths, we map relevant learning experiences that allow people to know that the skills that they are acquiring, um, the knowledge that they're gaining is tracking them towards a future path. And how do we keep that cycle going with learning in the flow of work, micro learning, nano learning, micro moments of learning, so that it's a continuous cycle and it becomes part of the way in which we adopt and approach the skilling of our own, um, our own space and, and time, but also that of others and that of others that are coming to us to support them with their own learning journeys. Student experiences, so looking at different digital, digital credentialing technologies, the power of the data to drive the student experience so that again it all talks to that personalized relevance in which we create within learning um, learning experiences and the sort about smart campuses and I've got we were going to talk a little bit about an agile campus or a digital campus you know and the, the the correlation between the physical space in which learning has traditionally taken place and where the digital component can come in to support that um, and what is that blended model going to look like going forward? And then the different modalities or different learning vehicles that we could have. You know, we've got apprenticeships and internships that are catering for new jobs and new opportunities in the fourth industrial revolution. We've got immersive technologies that we can apply not only within um, a work environment, but in a learning environment. We can use virtual reality to simulate experiences in the real world. We can use a lot of the technologies that are driving the fourth industrial revolution and find strong application for them from a learning point of view. And I think that's what's exciting about, you know, embracing what is happening through the fourth industrial revolution into learning and really seeing, well, how is it that we can think differently about the way we deliver learning and how we make sure that what we're doing is relevant going forward. The next slide talks a little bit to trends and learning strategies. And there's been a lot shift to, to these trends over the, over the past couple of years. And we're really seeing that this will be stronger and stronger and more relevant going forward. So certainly um, from a business strategy point of view, we're seeing a lot more alignment of the learning strategy to the business strategy. It's not something that gets done in isolation. It gets done as an integral part of the business strategy ensuring that the business has got the skills that it needs to execute on its strategy going forward. And I think that it's where, again, talking to the point of skills changing so rapidly, we've got skills that aren't relevant for as long as they used to. If the business strategy can't predict what it's gonna need in terms of skills, how do we develop our talent to be aligned to it? And that is true from schools and the K-12 space and the college and the university space, and even in the world of the corporate and the industry itself, we've got to get better at defining what skills we're going to need soon enough to build our talent pipelines um, and create economic and employment opportunities for our young people into those. We see a hybrid model for alignment between local and global needs. And definitely where you know, South Africa is extremely well positioned, the continent is extremely well positioned to really align with global needs and be able to create learning that can be exported. We, we don't need to think about learning in the confines of our, our physical place and space in which learning has been delivered. So we see a real model which will allow us to take a global approach with a local flavor. Um, integration of talent and learning strategy, I think I've spoken a little bit to this around, you know, making sure that we're designing the talent to meet what the requirements are making sure that we define the effectiveness of learning, create tools, use tools, use data to measure the effectiveness of learning, measure the effectiveness of human capital contribution to business strategy. You know, leverage the fact that, you know, it's not less investment that is needed in development of human capital, it's greater investment. Um, and we need to find ways that measure that effectiveness to validate the, the, the potential of continuous learning for employees and for people throughout their lifelong learning journey to be able to remain effective. And then on-demand education, I think this, this is more and more critical that the, the need for learning when it's needed, we have to be able to find ways that we can cater for that. Um, you know, looking at micro master programs, for example, or nano degrees, you know, not needing to be able to achieve qualification or certification over such a long period of time, 
which doesn't necessarily give the certainty that that will track into the career or the economic opportunity that people are looking for. So I think lots to think about at a strategic level as we go through this. Trends and learning methodologies is the next slide. So really looking and saying, well, the learning methodologies that we used to apply, how relevant are those methodologies today and how can we adapt them? So the methodologies are still sound in what the methodologies were, but are they meeting the needs and the requirements that we have going forward? So looking here sort of at this developmental learning mix, and I'm not going to talk through all of that, but really sort of saying, talking to the blend, how do we use traditional forms of instructor-led training? How do we blend digital learning into that? How do we use technology by way of virtual classrooms to still deliver synchronous and asynchronous learning, but in a remote way in which learning is taking place right now? So the integration of technology and formal learning definitely has been happening and is being at this point in time accelerated through um, you know, the pandemic and the effect that that has had around the physical learning space. Ubiquitous learning, learning anywhere, anytime. You know, that ability for access, again, how create accessibility to good quality learning experiences at that moment of need. Social learning and knowledge exchange. Um, again, you know, it comes up in the trends all the time, this peer-to-peer -peer learning, the ability for people to learn from one another, experiential learning that be, can be created beyond formal learning and development departments, beyond formal academia, beyond teachers in the classroom. How do we create engagement for learners to learn from one another and create and use similar social networks to what we use in, in the context of our social collaboration and communication, like a, like a Facebook scenario. How do we use that, but really embed learning and effective learning outcomes into it? And then competency-based, um, online competency-based learning programs tend to be less expensive, tend to be more on demand, tend to be quite targeted in terms of what they, what they are seeking to achieve as an outcome of the program, and generally very, very aligned to opportunities that would exist in industry and in the workplace. So a little bit about that. And then the trend shifting towards practical and skills-based training. So there's a, a real shift at the moment that we are seeing and experiencing as a global trend to, to again, that, that bridge between the higher education institutions, community colleges, and into the industry itself. Um, and how do we accelerate and support that shift? So you've got some key supporting elements there of two, two, two buckets. One shift towards a more practical skills-based training approach some of the recommendations that we make there around partnering with institutions and career centers, creating a greater degree of collaboration between the two worlds and, and really coming to understand the value that each one has and how in this fast track paced world of change that we're in, we can support one another, identify gaps and find ways to be able to close that um, in, in a really innovative and experiential way. And then the shift towards lifelong learning, the key supporting elements are there on the left and some of the re recommendations sort of pilot issuing credentials that are much more granular. So how do we acknowledge smaller components of learning um, that happen perhaps through a broader program, but they give, the, they, they give a credential that a person can use as a very specific skill um, in their backpack of skills that they have to help track them on their journey. Um, and building the required learning platforms, incorporating tools, helping along the whole value chain of the student management life cycle as well, from student recruitment, enrollment, faculty design, um, you know, and really engaging faculty in the process, helping to change their skill set. You know, how do we help take our lecturers, how do we help take our teachers on a journey and empower them with the tools that they can use, very simple authoring tools, create and design content in a slightly different way build curriculum in a different way, load that into a learning management system, you know, get creative with the way learning is produced or the way learning is curated. There's a lot of great learning out there that can be curated and aggregated and built into learning programs. It's not that it all needs to be created. And just the really practical ways that, you know, we can support and help um, learning and development professionals pivot their own set of skills um, in, into this digital future. And then the last slide from a trends point of view, just having a look um, again here from a learning technology on the old world and a learning technology in the new world. So very much it was more a push, um, you know, from an old world, whether it was lectures or classrooms, it was very formal learning events that were happening at a very specific 
place and time, more mandated in terms of the curriculum. Whereas you're seeing like into the new world and into the future, more of a push and a pull. Learning and knowledge management becoming important, this blended learning. It's not about taking everything out of that mode of, of real-time instructor-led learning and placing it into a digital environment. It's, it's finding the most effective combination of where the digital supports the physical, the, the human connector of accessing a, a, a real subject matter expert, a lecturer, a facilitator, you know, having that combined with what I can do in self-directed learning and exploratory learning, the formal and the informal, the, the, the MOOCs and so on. Um, so yeah, I'm conscious of, of, of time, so I'll, I'll go a little bit quicker. Um, I think I'm just going to pause there, Greg. So that's the slides around the trends before we move into having a little bit more at, at a look at some of the learning technologies that could support this. Great. Thank you, Kirsty. And, and just while we're at this, this point, if you've got any comments or questions, please type those into the chat. Um, and as we continue, we'll, we'll try and address them. Um, Kirsty, there have been a couple of comments. Um, I, I won't go through all of them, but, but just some of the the one that struck me was this move towards more skills-based uh, training, because I think in higher education, we often focus so much on the content. You know, we start with, here's the textbook that students need to go through um, and, and don't perhaps focus enough on the skills. So what would you kind of recommend or suggest in terms of how we can look to be more skills focused when it comes to, to learning and development? So, yeah, I, th I think that's part of the transformational journey for academia. And I'm, I'm using this, you know, whether it's college, higher education, K-12, we've always done it that way, you know, and from being a teacher myself, um, worked in the university space, we've, that's always been the approach that we've taken. And, and that's the way academia has, has, has been for, for, for decades. And I think the challenge in, in shifting that model is actually coming through the pace of life that we're living now. And this need to always make sure that our skills are relevant and constantly being changed. So I think it's to rethink curriculum design. It's actually to come down to that base point of saying, the textbooks are still going to be really, really relevant, but is it the whole textbook or is it that there are sections of that that are relevant? And what specifically is the outcome of that? So that's how you get more into your nano learning design. And it's the combination of the blocks of nano learning that create your broader program. But they have real relevance almost in a standalone, a standalone unit of learning or, or nugget of learning. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then Khada asks, um, can you explain a bit more what you meant by when you're talking about student retention, about using personalization strategies? Or, yeah, or a so, personalization strategy. Absolutely. So one of the things that, you know, te technologies, uh, you know, like your artificial intelligence and technologies like that is it can actually be leveraged in a learning platform or as part of a, a, a learning technology stack. And I'll share a slide with you on that just now. But it can be used in that to start to understand the preferences of a learning, a, a learner and the learner's persona. So that could come down to the preference of content, the style of content that a learner learns best through. They might learn better through watching a video. They might learn better through animation. They might learn better through an interactive e-learning module that allows them to actually engage. So artificial intelligence has a, the ability to really personalize a learning journey. So we can be on the same learning journey or the same learning experience, but we're not necessarily receiving the same information in the same format at the same time. So the personalization talks to being able to use the intelligence of the data and the personalization of how we all learn in slightly different ways and create individual learning pathways within a broader structure of learning. So I think things like that make it really exciting and also really talk to inclusiveness in learning. We don't all learn at the same pace. We don't all, you know, retain knowledge in the same way and have the ability to apply that knowledge in the same way. And this is where some of the, the, the learning applications of artificial intelligence that are coming out are so exciting for the future. Um, you know, we, and it's part of that, you know, we, can, we need to change how we learn and give, use tools that allow us to be able to do that. And the technology is getting stronger and stronger to support it if we open our minds to the application of it in, in our learning institutions. 
Great, thank you. I think that's so important about, about trying to make sure that um, learning is really um, there meeting the needs of a particular student or particular learning that, that we're not giving the same, you know, one size fits all approach to everybody. Um, there's a couple of other comments, but I think let's, let's pause them there and continue into the next section. Thank you, Kirsty. Absolutely. And I mean, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll be able to touch and answer some of them as we go through. I can't see the questions coming up in the chat, otherwise I would incorporate it. And I'm too petrified at this moment in time to change away from what's working. So I'm going to carry on. Um, so I think what's represented here in a next generation learning environment is put, put the student in the center, put the student in the heart of what you want to do and design your learning experience around them and for them. And that comes down to, you know, all the little blue blocks in the center, you know, the choice of your learning management system, the choice of how your learner is going to be accessing that learning. Will it be on their mobile phone? You know, do we have to have considerations around data? Do we need to accommodate for an offline learning system? Do we have to cater for things where learners are able to be in a Wi-Fi zone and connected? They can get content into their mobile app. They can go away and anywhere offline learn from that, but the system still records and tracks that learning. And at the point where they go back and they've got connection, that record of learning comes back. So the intentional design around what would work in this learning technology space needs careful thought and consideration. Um, you've got in there around your course material delivery, we've spoken quite a bit to that. You know, what are our analytics? What, what, what learning analytics do we want to get from our students? We, we need to know more than they've just, just completed an e-learning module and they passed an assessment with 80%. We can learn and know so much more about our students. And the more we know and understand them, the more relevant we can create the learning experiences for them. Um, you know, the simplicity around the dashboards, how do they see what learning they're in, what learning is coming, what learning might they want to have choice from? Um, so creating the environment where it's not so prescriptive it is more choice driven the choice of different digital content and digital assets allow people to be able to decide and and and, and build components around their own learning journey that work best for them so that's sort of a, it's just a little bit around some of the thoughts and the, the things to consider when you're making these decisions um, you know, the interoperability between systems, so increasingly we're wanting to make integrations between different systems, so how do we make sure what we want in our learning environment is interoperable with other systems and other tools. Um, the personalization element comes up here as well, as does the analytics. And collaboration, I think increasingly the collaboration between all sorts of different institutes and all sorts of different partners is becoming more and more critical. Um, and yeah, I've got some specific examples, but I won't go into it now. So I'd like to get through the presentation, um, but also I can maybe share a couple of case studies that would be helpful. So, so this slide here talks to driving the Agile campus with technologies. So Agile as in it's a combined physical digital world. And I'm going to start at the bottom of this slide. So at the bottom of this slide, you, you, you think about decisions around authoring and development tools, you know, to create and source content. There's many, many different tools, and that's not a, um, an infinite list that we've put there. But it's really important that you make a decision for your organizational institution around what tools will you use? And what tools are going to be easy if the intent is to be able to upskill lecturers to be able to author their own content? What are the tools that would best be suited to the outcomes you're seeking to achieve? And then, you know, acquire those tools and understand the capabilities of them. And it's almost to have one or two. You definitely don't need all of what is there. And then you need to manage the learning. So where will that content go? Where will your learning experiences be created? And that's typically within a learning management or a content management system. It manages the learning process and it manages the, 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 the student engagement within that platform. And the choice there is really broad from your, your open source um, learning management systems like Moodle, through to your proprietary learning management systems like Blackboard and many, many others. So decisions to make around that space. And often what we'll advise to our customers is say, you've got to understand the functions that you want your system to achieve to work for you. Because once you understand that, then you'll be able to find the platform that's going to work best for you. So um, it's really important to sort of help design the functional element and the functional specification of what you need 
and then use that to guide the process of what you're going to what you're going to adopt. And then lots and lots of different experience tools, as you will see there from the communication social collaboration tools. How do they all fit together um, with, within this um, stack of technologies? Content delivery platforms, um, your learning experience platforms that might overlay or create micro, um, micro learning experiences or reinforcement experiences. Um, and then your virtual classroom. So increasingly we're needing in our technology stack a virtual classroom to deliver real-time learning um, but we want that in our platform. We don't want to have to go out and have our Zoom session outside of, the, outside of the learning management system. We want it all to be together. Why? Because it all connects to the learning record store. And in the learning record store is where we can gather the richness of the data to really make sure we've got measurement that learning is taking place, that effective learning is taking place, and many things that we want to be able to measure within that. So it's building up the stack that, um, you know, sometimes people think it's just about one bit or the other. But if you have a clear view of what this looks like for your organization, then it makes the strategy to implement your digital and blended learning across the organization that much easier. Um, I spoke at the beginning just a little bit about workflow learning. Um, and I really like what my team wrote here, that people are curious creatures by nature and demand instant responses to their quest for information. So let's provide learners with the tools and the content that they need to succeed. And this brings up this point about micro moments. So a micro moment is an intent rich moment when a person turns to a device to act on a need. Every single day, all of us do this. We'll go on our mobile because we want to know something. We want to know what's the temperature in Cape Town. We want to do something. We want to go somewhere. We want to buy something. Every day, we are having micro moments. And how do we create that in our learning design? You know, what people might want to know, and then how do we create the place for them to go and find it? So do we want them to go and find it on Google, or do we want to create this as something that they can easily go and find within the learning ecosystem that we design. Um, so it's just to, to sort of bring that in. And the statistic here, 91% of smartphone users turn to their smartphone for ideas while doing a given task, to research, to, you know, to, to, to get information. So the behavior, I guess the point of this from a learning point of view is that the behavior is there. People are doing it anyway. How do we make it relevant in the way we put our learning experiences together? Um, and then just a slide around seizing micro moments. Um, so on the left hand side of the side, looking at the learning and performance ecosystem, so sort of tapping into what makes, might, makes us as humans and drive more successful learning experiences using the digital technology to enable it. Um, the process flow there, how learners, how workers learn within the process of doing what they're doing. Um, so study, you know, how do people within your organization, even your learning institutions, how are they, what are they doing? How are they accessing information? How do we adopt that way of doing things into what we design for within the organization? Um, similarly, I think we've spoken quite a bit about the content and the technology, but starting in the circle in the middle was from our, I want to know. So there's an awareness, there's a notice, there's a commitment, I want to know and I want to learn. So I've got engagement, I want to learn, I want to practice, I want to perform. I want to apply it, I want to refine it, and then I want to grow, so your advocacy, I want to reflect, I want to sustain it. So that's in your micro moment learning journey, and it, it, it's a continuous cycle, that's why it's the circle with the arrows, and it's happening all the time. We're all having these moments all the time, and some of them we will take into a continued loop, and others we, um, others will, we, you, we'll, we'll keep going, we won't, so I'm very conscious of time. And then how does it impact into the business? Um, I will keep going. Um, Greg, you must stop me if you want to. Nudge learning, this is a pretty quick slide, but I think quite cool to touch on. So it's, it's coming from e-commerce. So where you'll get an e-commerce notification. You might be buying something online and it will nudge you to add it to your basket. It'll nudge you to go to your checkout. It'll nudge you to do certain things. Similar context in nudge learning. So this is an actual um, sort of method of learning really relevant right now we think just given the situation that we're in and you know how can we apply it to improve knowledge retention you know create a familiar user experience 
make it inclusive, make our micro learning moments built into it, give learners control and a social belonging. Um, and there's an example here, we, we've come across a wonderful application through this pandemic called Connect Yard. And, you know, where many learning institutions, were ch the challenge was getting engagement into the learning management system. Everyone was resorting to WhatsApp groups, everyone's resorting to external tools. Um, so we've got these things and moments of learning happening, but all over the place, very disparate. And what Connect Yard brings is an integration with all of those external tools into your learning management system. So all of your notifications, all of your communications can go from the learning management system out to any of these different channels and be still recorded and tracked back into the learning management system. So yeah, one of many amazing technologies that are out there. Um, I said a little bit more about social learning, but I'm going to just leave the slide here and just ask Greg um, if you, if, if we, I'm assuming we are needing to close. So. I think there was only two two further slides after this about digital content. Okay, um, thanks, Kirsty. It is it is three o'clock, so if you do need to leave um, because you have other commitments, then 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 you can. I just like to remind everyone that um, the the session is being recorded, and we will also share Kirsty's slides after the session with everyone that registered. Um, Kirsty, uh, it, it is it is three o'clock, but I think we we probably got about ten maybe 15 minutes that we can have left. So I think maybe yeah. if you, you can present for five more minutes um, and then we'll spend the last 10 minutes um, just on questions. Just I had uh, one quick question um, is you were talking about the Agile campus um, and someone's just asked if you can explain what you mean a little bit more about what that means an Agile campus. Yeah, so, so um, an Agile campus from I guess a way of delivering learning. So having agility that the learning doesn't have to happen on the campus itself, that the learning can happen in the physical campus, it can happen in your digital campus. You've got the agility to create different ways and different experiences of delivering the learning that you have been delivering. Um, and I think that's been for many um, academic organizations and training companies over this pandemic, it's been one of the things that they've grappled with the most is you know, having to be able to move or pivot from being more traditional in the approach of instructor led training and on a physical campus and having those physical campuses forced through the lockdown and forced through the pandemic to close, finding ways and creating agility in order to be able to have continuity in the teaching and learning process. So, yeah, we kind of coined the agile campus. Um, in, in light of what's been happening and how, how we are able to use this in a positive way and find positive opportunity to introduce the digital space whilst honoring the physical, um, the physical environment as well. So when we do get back to going into a physical environment, will we retain the digital way of delivering? And I, I can give you an example of that in um, some of the schools um, that I'm, I'm aware of or, or know people who've got children in, 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 in the context of South Africa. They pivoted to online learning and they were delivering the school curriculum online. When they were allowed to send children back into schools and there was a, there was a period where we could, schools were opened again, not all parents felt comfortable with that. And the way that some of these schools have and are still today operating is that they're delivering online learning and physical learning at the same time and keeping continuity of teaching and learning in that way. So again, it's coming back, it's providing parents and learners, particularly if they're more vulnerable or susceptible to, um, to COVID-19, there's a choice. They, they don't have to physically be there to have a continued learning experience. And a couple of these schools you know, they said to me, Kirsty, we think we'll, we'll do this post lockdown. We, we want to continue to offer parents and students an alternative way of learning. And they might want to learn for two days of the week at home and they might want to be on campus and doing, you know, more of the um, sort of sporting activities and other activities there. So just creating options of choice. And I guess that's thinking to new ways of doing things that had we not have had the pandemic, I don't think we would have been there in our thought process around that at this stage. I hope that answers the question. So, so yeah, sorry, so, Greg. Yeah, so then we've, we've got a couple of comments coming through people saying, you know, one of the things that is exhausting is that there are so many technologies and tools, and often as, as lecturers, those 
decisions are made about what tools to use or happen you know at a higher level in the university and, and they're not always consulted um, and so you continuously feel both as lecturers and as students um, that we have to continuously learn new tools um, so do you have any suggestions in terms of how to manage this this process of kind of constantly trying to keep up with with, with technologies yeah, so I, I really think it comes down to very intentional design of what the technologies are that are going to be used. It should definitely be a consultative process with everybody that is going to be part of that ecosystem. So from the students themselves to the lecturers, if you're going to involve um, parents, you know, whatever parties are going to be part of this, they should be part of the team that are actually designing the functional specifications of what will work. Um, because it's a, it's a strategic decision. The decision is made to use this and to go down a digital route or a blended route for, for, for many different reasons. And I think sometimes the, the, the choice is made to buy technology. It's almost like, well, whatever comes first or whatever is quickest to, to get. And only once it's then been done and they're realizing it's not necessarily doing what they had hoped or thought that it would do, are they actually then designing what they wanted it to do? And it should be the other way around. The design of what you need should be the first priority of what you do. And even if it takes slightly longer to do, then you've got a measurement of what you can map the technologies against to make sure that it's going to do what you want to do. Um, and also, you know, to be able to do that in quite a neutral space. Um, you know, so I, I think it's just important to get the, the functional design of what you need to do, why you're doing it, what you want to achieve from it, and how you're going to measure that in place first and then, then go and find the right tools that, that, that work for you. Great, thank you, Kirsten. I think a, a key point there for, for all of us is to try and make sure that when our institutions introduce new technologies or tools is that we, and it's not always easy, I know, but to try and get involved in those decision-making processes or give input into them or, or ask about how, why certain tools were chosen and, and how they're used. And most importantly, that there's time given for both academics and students to kind of learn how to start to use those tools and, and how they intended to be used. Um, Kirsty, um, the other question that's come through a few times is that given the kind of economic and socio realities of not just in South Africa, but also in Africa, um, you know, there's lots of amazing tools and technologies coming out, but how do we make sure that um, with the wild inequalities that we don't end up leaving a lot of students behind um, because they don't necessarily have access to some of that infrastructure? Mm, absolutely. So I think that there are some, well, I don't think, I know, there are some amazing open source technologies out there. We've always supported um, open source technologies, open educational resources. You know, there is a lot of great stuff out there that, that doesn't come with per learner, per annum, um, sort of software as a service licensing based cost. And, and it doesn't create equal access um, to learning. Um, and, and I think that exploring the open source software is, is, is really something that I would encourage people to look at. Um, you know, Moodle for, as one example, from the learning management system, and, and globally, I mean, Moodle has been around since, um, since, the, since 1996, I think it was, it was first founded. It's got an incredible community of global developers that are continually contributing to the code, one of the most widely used in the world. And, you know, sometimes people have maybe had an experience of being in a Moodle platform, but there is a specific way in which you can configure Moodle and customize it and create a really amazing learning experience with that. So I think, you know, it's, it's important to look for Moodle partners. It's important to find people that can advise organizations and institutions on these tools, you know, that it isn't that you feel like you're, you're out there in the dark and not knowing how to do it. I think, you know, look at the open, even, even the um, creation tools, some authoring environments, we, we ran a project in Saudi Arabia where we were working with the Ministry of Education and training teachers on really simple authoring tools that allowed them to create their own little animations. They were all open, open source tools that they downloaded um, onto their laptop and they could go in and we just spent a couple of days training them on how to use those tools and then coaching them through a six month program as they were creating really amazing little um, modules of learning or little animations 
and they were populating that into the national um, the national learning platform of, of, of that the ministry has in Saudi. So, you know, being able to create teacher generated content, once you've got the right tools and the right knowledge of how to do this, you know, you can empower your organization to get behind, you know, the creation of content or the curation of content. And again, I'll say this great open educational resource content out there. The challenge is always to find what's relevant to what you are trying to create. So you need to be able to work, have the time to work through it and find the components that would, would, would almost plug into your learning experience that you're designing for. Great, thank you. And I'm so happy you mentioned the use of open educational resources because as an association, Nadioso, that's one of the things that we really promote is not only the able, that you're able to, to, to use and adapt content that's already being created um, in other circumstances or contexts for your own needs, but that you don't have to pay for that content. So that does minimize costs in terms of in terms of, of teaching, but also that you as an educator or an academic, you can create your own content that you use and you can share that with with other institutions with other lecturers that they can take advantage of doing that. So that's, that's something that we really at, at Nadiosa do, do really believe in and we try and, and ensure that 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 message gets out there. Um, Kirsty, um, I'm going to allow just um, for people just to ask if they've got any final questions. Um, while they're doing that, I'd just like to go back to that the title of your presentation is The Future of Learning is Digital, The Future is Now. What, and without putting you too much on the spot, um, what would you say to, for example, a university manager or who a lecturer is still not so sure that this digital thing is really the way to go and kind of sees you know, the impact of COVID where we're forced to go and, and use, use technologies as something, as something, you know, of, a, of almost a phase and hopes that we'll go back to a kind of more traditional way of teaching and learning. How would you, how would you, you know, try and encourage such a person to, to really to, to try and shift to the belief that that's the future is now and not something in the future? Yeah, look, I, I, I think, I think there's definitely been a COVID has given a big push in that direction and, and, and accelerated the pathway for many organizations or institutions to get there. And I, I really do respect and appreciate that it is quite a scary journey to go on. Um, and, you know, when everything has always operated in a certain way, the change to operate in a different way is a process that also requires time to work through. So I would say, you know, depending on your readiness in that journey of adopting digital in whatever way, shape and form works for your organization, I would really strongly encourage to, 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 to keep it as an active discussion within, you know, within your universities and have an active discussion with your students. You know, talk to them about how they're using technology in their lives. Talk to them about how you know, what is the application of technology for them? How important is it? How do they want to learn? Um, and pilot, do small pilots and try things in different ways. Um, I think, yeah, don't, don't be scared to do things in small pieces and accept that not everything will work. That it's, not a, it's not the same recipe for every organization, every institution. So I'd say just take a bold step and try and and know that it's not i've never promoted that it's a one or another one or the other it for me it's the hybrid and the, the more we're able to get that hybrid model right and find our own agile campuses find what works you know what bits do we do digital what will be physical what will remain physical for for the future and how do we you know even look to reach more students that maybe can't physically get there and maybe cost is prohibitive in that model as well. So can we make cheaper cost options for more learners to have access to the amazing learning that is happening in these institutions by giving them options to join in maybe in nano programs, smaller programs. So yeah, I mean, to look at the business model as well and the commercial model around, around learning. Great. I think that's, that's really important that you mentioned that this, this, this journey towards using more digital is very much a process. And it is, as you said, to take small steps at a time. And sometimes you take a step and it's not going to work. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it does require you to keep, to keep trying different things. And, and sometimes things will work and sometimes don't work. But I also like your, your advice to say, do con 
consult with your students, find out what technologies they're using, find out the things that they that they are that they have access to and that they can use and, and try and build some of your strategies around that. Okay, um, I think we have to we have to pause it there. So there were a couple of questions, Kirsty, just in terms of how um, people can get in touch with you. So either perhaps you directly, or I don't know if you've got a general way of getting in touch with TTRO. If you can just if if people have follow up questions or they'd like advice or or perhaps to to engage with the with with your company, um, how can they do so? Yes, look, I mean, you're absolutely welcome to get in touch with me directly. Um, I think what will be easiest, and I maybe have this in my final slide, um, I'll, I'm very happy to share my contact details. Um, oh, there's a couple of slides on digital adoption and then learning content, but you'll get these when they come through to you. I will put my contact details, my mobile number, my email address um, on the end of this presentation. And yes, by all means, please reach out. Um, We're ttro.com is our website. and yeah, again, I thank you for the participation. Greg, I thank you for setting it up. Ibrahim, I'm so sorry to put you through that at the beginning of this call. I'm so glad that we've got to the end of it. I feel much calmer than I did when we started. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Great, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much, Kirsty. I think you, you've given us a lot to, th to think about. And I think a couple of people have mentioned they're quite eager to get on the slide so they can revisit and, and think about some of the concepts that you've been talking about and, and just think about it at early, uh, further. So thanks very much to our presenter, Kirsty Chadwick, who's the CEO of TTRO, uh, for sharing with us this afternoon. Thank you to each one of you um, for joining us in this Nadiosa webinar. As I said earlier, we will share the slides as well as the recording for this webinar with, with everyone who registered for the webinar. I'd like you just to just alert you to also that this is the second in our webinar series for 2020. So we have one more webinar scheduled um, that will take place at the beginning of, on the 2nd of October and their focus is around collaborative online learning or collaborative e-learning and ways of getting uh, students to engage or collaborate um, or work together in the online space. And I see there's, there's just one comment here from one of the participants that I thought was really, really good. And I thought perhaps is a nice way to end off um, today's webinar. Um, and this comes from, sorry, it's hidden. I can't see the name, um, but it used, says that digital learning used to be frowned upon and now it's slowly becoming the new normal. And I think that's, that's the space where, where all of us are in at the now, where we're trying to make use of digital learning and incorporate as best we can into our teaching learning experiences so that we can help our students succeed. So thank you very much for joining us in our webinar today. We hope that you have a good rest of the day and we look forward to engaging with you in future uh, Nadiosa webinars and other Nadiosa forums. Thank you very much and goodbye everybody. Thank you so much, goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.